Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Stephen Lee, I'm the president of the Harvard Crimson. Um, I'm Maddie, I'm the editor of the Crimson. Yeah, and today uh, we're going to talk a little about um, an issue that I, I assume a lot, of, um, a lot of you guys are covering on campus, which is um, the issue of sexual assault. Uh, and so we just wanted to share sort of sort of our sort of our story and like um, last year um, we were both on the college administration beat and so we sort of covered uh, a lot of the sexual assault issues so we just wanted to share sort of like how like we approached it and like sort of the storyline that came out of it yeah yeah I mean Harvard in particular had like kind of a bunch of threads going on at once over the last like year and a half um, of course there's been kind of a national conversation about um, and a lot of title line investigations going on but um, for Harvard, it already had one at Harvard Law School for um, four years, which was one of the longest investigations, except for Princeton, I think, like outstanding. Um, and then we also had, although we were on the news side, and I still work on the news side of the paper, um, our editorial board, which is completely the opinion section separate kind of editorially from the news side, but they published an op-ed that got a lot of attention um, and also spurred conversation kind of on campus on the student side. And then we had a new policy come out, um, and there was a lot of kind of pushback from multiple sides of the issue from students, which I think has been the angle that with the Title IX investigations at the Office of Civil Rights and the Department of Education has kind of been the center, but then we've also had pushback from law professors at Harvard Law School who traditionally are very outspoken um, and have kind of made this like a very national issue on the other direction. And so we've kind of been covering, a senior kind of coverage go, I would say, from like the student-focused Title IX investigation front to the policy angle um, and kind of pushback from people who argue that like, policies and the way the government interprets the, interprets the law like doesn't adequately protect the accused. So it's sort of an interesting like trajectory, I think, in terms of where our coverage has gone. Yeah, so our, so like, um, so again, like, like Maddie mentioned, um, as like, as sort of like national attention was sort of being, a lot of, like, a lot more of national attention was being placed on the issue. Um, we had an anonymous op-ed run the Crimson, um, basically a first person account of like an aftermath of sexual assault case, um, a sexual assault situation, and that sort of sparked campus debate on the, and that like really ignited um, sort of a conversation around campus about like the sexual assault issue. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so we started off sort of by like approaching it as, um, well, let's take a look at this like 20 year old policy. And this is a, I, yeah, so this is a, so what we did was we sort of went through and looked at um, um, Ivy League universities and sort of what the, like what the difference between ours and theirs were. And we, we found that, um, you know, uh, the performance of the evidence standard, which sort of um, the Office of Civil Rights sort of recommends um, now sort of is sort of mandating that, that colleges use, like was not used at Harvard compared to his peer institutions. So that was pretty interesting. And that sort of like developed the conversation around, or like further developed the conversation around the issue. Um. And so then another kind of thread came to the fore when um, in April, or actually end of March last year, um, a group of undergraduates, like two signatories, like on behalf of like kind of this proxy for 10 people, um, filed a complaint like with the Office of Civil Rights, um, alleging that Harvard College's policy um, you know, violated Title IX, and that was sort of also the focus of the op-ed. Um, was this question of like what standards of evidence are used, what the definition is of what counts as sexual assault, in particular the issue of affirmative consent, which I'm sure that is something that activists on probably all your campuses have talked a lot about. And in California in particular, people have called it like the yes means yes law. Activists on our campus actually disagree with kind of that characterization of it. But um, and so there's a lot of coverage kind of there where we did have um, you know student activists who uh, kind of filed this who were happy to come forward and talk to us about kind of what their complaints were, and although we filed, because Harvard's a private institution, which means that we cannot FOIA Harvard for kind of the kind of documents in this kind of situation, and while we did put in a FOIA request for the government, because it's an ongoing investigation, they declined and declined like appeals, um, but these, in this case, students, like, these student sources, like, are pretty comfortable with us, um, and were willing to kind of give us more information there, which was interesting, um, and then... So then kind of that was kind of the status, I guess, if you could say, going into the summer. <coughs> um, and again, you know, there are other coverage related to like kind of the government's approach. The White House task force came out with recommendations about how colleges should be supporting victims and different issues like that. Um, but then over the summer, Harvard kind of unveiled what had been the works for over a year, um, completely new policy that completely like overhauled the way that Harvard approached it. Um, what's really interesting about Harvard kind of institutionally is it's a very, very big school with like 12 degree granting schools that all operate very independently traditionally. Um, however, this policy, really the first of its kind, like on any issue, um, tried to bring in line like, the <laughs> definition of sexual harassment across every single school. Um, and that was actually a big change. Um, although it didn't include like explicit affirmative consent language, like it didn't call it an affirmative consent policy, um, 
kind of leaders maintain that it essentially is one, although students kind of disagree with that. And so we kind of saw after this kind of policy went into play that our um, kind of coverage went from kind of the student angle to actually looking at this policy and the way that people kind of felt about it and actually the implementation of it. Um, yeah, so one of the one of the cornerstones of the of the policy was that um, we had so, um, so so some of the conversation around sexual assault has been you know there are these people who are adjudicating your case who have no like legal background um, and they're not experts like they're just deans of the college who are like deans of respective universities just sort of deciding on like a three person panel deciding on your case so one of the hallmarks of so the Harvard's new policy was that they they were going to bring in out like investigators that were going to be hired by the university to investigate all sexual assault cases across uh, like all of Harvard, which was like a huge like change. Right. Um, and so one of the one of the investigatory um, articles that we wrote is about how um, you know a couple months in with the new policy, they still hadn't filled all the spots for the investigators. They actually only had one investigator, and I think they still currently only have only have one investigator <coughs> when they wanted three investigators full-time um, so we sort of um, and then another another corollary to sort of that story was looking at like how much they were willing to pay the title line investigators because you know they were sort of you know there's like this website where they're like oh Harvard jobs and so we sort of looked at the data and just picked out a couple of jobs um, and we saw that there are like for instance um, like a spokesperson for the faculty of arts and sciences um, would be making more than the title line investigator who's supposed to be investigating sexual assault cases yeah, and that, um, and then of course, like I think it's important if we're talking about kind of more than beyond what we did. I think it's important, like when you're doing this kind of, like I think the role actually, especially when I'm sure you guys will find administrators are very kind of mum on this issue, given that it's very sensitive. Harvard in particular was at this point under two federal investigations when there's an active incentive not to talk at all about it because they don't want to run into legal issues with there being liabilities with saying something incorrect or where they misquoted by some outlet, and so generally the kind of responses no comment and so outside expert sources can be very helpful in this case and although of course we're going to have Harvard comment on the fact that they were only offering you know less than a hundred thousand dollars for this position or depend the range is between like 60 and 100 um, compared to like a spokesperson or like an executive chef who's making a very similar amount um, we were able to have outside lawyers say who focus on this issue saying there's no way you're going to get a JD who is experienced in this will work for you, um, and so that's probably kind of part of Harvard's problem. Yeah. So I mean, we, I mean, in this case, it was like we sort of ex like exploited the fact that they were looking for these investigators, and like they posted like very publicly online what they were like planning to offer and the qualifications that they wanted for the people. So that sort of worked out, and they were also hiring the spokesperson had just got promoted, so like they were also hiring for that. So that was sort of like a coincidence that. It sort of like kind of worked out for us. Um, and then kind of amid this, there was still the investigation ongoing um, with regards to the college. Again, kind of using the situation where Harvard would not like comment on what's going on with the investigation. And we certainly wouldn't have um, the government traditionally like their line is no comment on ongoing investigations. But again, like the students who were involved in this case who do meet um, with um, so it was a student activist group, they do meet with kind of the representatives from the government about the progress of the case. Um, we were able to talk to like multiple of them that we felt like were significant um, and confident enough sourcing to actually kind of report on what status they were at um, with regards to the fact they were coming to campus, talking to student groups, and had kind of laid out these plans for their timeline. So that was something that we were happy we were able to do. Um, and then this is kind of a story that came out of looking for um, doing a FOIA request again to the government. We like, again, frustrated that we couldn't get the current case information. I was interested, kind of one of our last stories we were interested in doing was kind of an analysis piece of, let's look at, based on previous cases and Harvard's interaction with the government, like what can we expect from this investigation at Harvard College, right? What will they be doing? What's trajectory look like? How things change? So we kind of did like a mass FOIA request um, to OCR from 2002, asking for any complaint um, that Harvard, originally the idea was, so we knew that there was like a 2002 investigation, um, an Title IX investigation we had previously reported on, Harvard was not found in violation, but we know there had at least been one, you know, 12 years ago. And we thought, well, what if there was one in between that Harvard had not disclosed and that we hadn't reported? Because until very recently, the government didn't use to announce when they were investigating schools. Um, and so, unless they complain, basically would come out and talk about it. And so we thought, let's like just kind of do a kind of blind FOIA request. If you want to explain that, because we actually did it. Yeah. So I, I just said, oh, if there are 50 schools that are being investigated now, and like this was like sort of like the highest, like people are like, oh, there's so many, so many investigations. Like going back to 2002, there probably weren't that many cases. Was like sort of my reasoning. Um, but it, what we ended up finding was that there are like a lot of people file Title Line like. Um, Title IX complaints all the time. And so I believe that we had, yeah, so we actually got data back for 7,500 
Title IX complaints like across like the United States and like completely accidental. So then we decided to publish it. Um, so I guess what the request was, I guess to back up, was that we literally just requested like between 2002 and this was the point September 2014, we wanted every single complaint like a kind of a database of every single Title IX complaint filed against a college in the United States between 2002 and 2014, whether or not they led to an investigation and what the um, outcome of that investigation was. And so we ended up getting like a database that we ended up uploading online. You can go look it up if you want to look up your school. Um, 7,500 cases, more than that, between that time period. Now, not cases that actually led to investigations, but complaints. Um, and then through that, we actually did find, well, there had been 18 complaints at Harvard in that time period. Most of them had been you know, withdrawn or found to not be actually legitimate. However, one had led, and we did a second FOIA to get these documents. Um, Harvard had been found, found in violation of Title IX in 2008, the medical school, um, over a case that we did FOIA for documents for and were able to kind of tell that story. Um, again, because you'll find that the federal government has put a lot of pressure on the issue now and made this very public, but this was very behind the scenes until extremely recently. And so there's actually a lot to dig up there, which is really interesting. Yeah, so, so I think, I think like, one thing is, like, to recommend is, like, you can just, you, can, you should just FOIA, like, what, like, all the, pa like, all the past records, because, like, other than the fact that they have to, like, blank out the names of the people, like, they're pretty, like, the documents we got back were pretty comprehensive. We got the complaint, um, every correspondence between Harvard and OCR during that time period between, um, you know, we had the actual letters, kind of, from um, the council who still works at Harvard, um, who dealt with the government at that time period. It was like, pretty enlightening. Yeah. Um, Harvard, and one thing that's worth noting is OCR is like totally swamped right now, as I'm sure you guys can imagine, given all the work that they're currently doing. Um, and this FOIA request, the, both of them took over three months to get, which is like more than they're supposed to take. Um, and we had to kind of complain multiple, multiple times and kind of say that we would like kind of make a fuss if we didn't get it. Um, and they had to do it in like two parts to make us get the most important documents, but um, this was kind of interesting and like, I don't know, if you're at a private school basically, although you can't FOIA your school, like there are pretty much any time you interact with a federal institution you can and so to take advantage of that because you never know like what will come up. And we were very surprised to like, get all the stuff that we did. Um, and I guess kind of the next thread that kind of came out of um, kind of the opposite direction rather than the OCR investiga investigatory angle um, was kind of the pushback from professors at the school, um, <laughs> particularly Harvard Law School, who kind of argue that they're experts on this issue. Um, a gender like lawyer who's actually very liberal is kind of leading this charge, Janet Halley, um, basically against Harvard's policy and really against the entire interpretation of the federal government of Title IX and they essentially argue that the way the government is interpreting Title IX right now is just like completely um, illegal. It's pretty much the argument that it does not adequately protect the accused. Um, and so they, their group of law professors, 28, which is a very large number, out of a faculty of only, you know, a little over 120, um, I believe, to, so they signed an open letter in the Austin Globe, slamming the policy, slamming Harvard for even the kind of engaging with the government on these investigations, um, basically calling for a total rewrite, um, which Harvard did not do, but they did. Um, and so the federal government found Harvard Law School, kind of concluded their four-year investigation, Title IX, in end of December, um, and found the law school in violation of Title IX, but it actually wasn't like that big of a deal in that um, they really found their old policies in violation of Title IX, not really Harvard's new. There were a couple like wording complaints they had, like this person's email should be like on a more clear page or something. But for the most part, they basically said Harvard's like new policy is more or less fine. Um, but despite, yeah, despite, despite that, despite that um, the law school sort of decided that they were going to create their own policy um, and sort of go against sort of the university-wide policy that um, Harvard unveiled just a couple, of, like several months ago. Um, Which in terms of governance was like a very big change, again, because this was really the first. Um, and again, so our university president, Drew Faust, one of her kind of big mantras has been like, one Harvard, I want to unite the university, we want to make our schools more in line with each other, make policies more consistent, especially on sensitive issues like this. And the Harvard Law Professors kind of interpreted basically disagrees with her entire philosophy toward that issue. Um, and so we kind of wrote a piece looking at when we got the new policy, um, got the new procedures, which were kind of brought to light by um, actually the Title IX ruling, which mentioned like these ambiguous, oh, the new policies, once they're put in place, like the government will work with you. And so we kind of bothered the law school to actually give us a copy of that and they made it public. Um, and so that was really interesting because they took um, what the law professors described, they still use preponderance of the evidence, which most of these law school professors fundamentally disagree with as like an okay standard of evidence for a case like this. 
but they did totally redo kind of the way that they approach cases. So they no longer use a central university-wide body that was lauded as great protection for victims and a way to fairly kind of adjudicate cases. Um, they just completely circumvented that totally and are going to do it their own way. Um, and that has kind of sparked our coverage going in a different direction, which is kind of also a university governance kind of coverage, if that makes sense. Um, because the law professors have continued, we have a law school reporter who's been writing about how these law professors continue, even though they have their own policy now, they continue to slam the central policy and complain about it, um, you know, ranging from complaints that um, it doesn't adequately protect academic freedom. So if you want to teach, you know, a course on rape law, for example, that that could be interpreted as sexual harassment, um, which the kind of central office denies. But there are a lot of really interesting concerns that have been brought up. Um, and so we've had some coverage that have related to kind of the process as well as behind how these very angry law school professors have challenged kind of Harvard's approach. Um, and so there's like an internal memo that we got a hold of that was circulated um, about it. But yeah, so I, I think. Um, this sort of thread sort of highlights that. I think I think one interesting thing is like um, coverage is almost always. I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't generalize, but like coverage has been focused on like um, student side and like what students feel about. But there is like I think there is like you might find that like professors are like conflicted about what they feel like what they really feel about like these policies, which like again like some like professors at the law school feel that like the the new like the Title IX regulations are giving too much. Um, to the victims and not enough, like not enough uh, legal protection for the accused, and so that's like an interesting angle that your like sexual assault coverage can take is like asking if you have like a law school um, that you cover, like ask the law professors like what they think about the fact that the government asks you to use preponderance of the evidence, which is only fifty percent plus one, when like the legal standard, like legal burden for everything else is sort of um, beyond reasonable doubt. So that's like an interesting um, angle that you can sort of take um, coverage. Yeah, and also yeah. just, I don't know, how an issue like this can just generally take like a lot of facets, I guess. So there's many, many angles to pursue. Um, and that part of it is like based on, again, like kind of who your very vocal conditions, constituencies are, yeah. I guess. But. Okay.